right, all right. Hey, everybody. This is Tom Barnes. Stories from the 78 podcast, the extension of the Stories from the 78 website. So I appreciate you uh, sticking around and hearing things on the podcast. And uh, this week was a fun week, man. They had the big Windy City smokeout that happens in Chicago every year. It's it's the 11th year. I remember the first year, it was at the old like Tribune printing plant, small little footprint. Now it's next to the United Center, and it's a massive footprint. They have like 20,000 people go Thursday through Sunday every day, 20,000 people. So very cool event if you've never been to Chicago, and you're thinking about what time of year to go. I would say you can't go wrong from like June through October. Those are probably like the best months to come if you're a weather person. If you don't care about the cold or like a rainy day, come whenever you want, obviously. But like that's festival season, like beginning of uh, mid-May all the way through October fest, you know, stuff like that is just festivals and outdoor events. It's the best time to be in this city. And Windy City Smokeout is no exception. Carrie Underwood was a headliner. I will fully admit that I am not a country music fan. But it was a uh, it the barbecues from all over like the South and Chicago. So plenty of options for barbecue, some burnt ends, if you know what I'm talking about. And they have elotes, they have Mexican spin on some barbecue food, because obviously, the Mexican um, community is huge in Chicago. So yeah, the food can't go wrong with the food at Windy City Smokeout. And the eye candy is on par, if you know what I'm talking about, for anybody. And uh, so yeah, it was a cool thing to do. And, uh, you know, obviously, Chicago is one of the food capitals of the United States, if not the food capital of the United States. If you've been here, you've been to the West Loop, you've been to Logan, you've been to Beverly, South Shore, Pilsen, Pullman, the food here is incredible. And pizza is always a hot topic in Chicago, right? You know, especially when you got, uh, you know, people from New York thinking that everything from New York is great, which is pretty common with New Yorkers, no offense. Uh, and you know, and a lot of times they're right, you know, like sometimes some things in New York are great. And, uh, I just feel like people from Chicago can admit that sometimes where people from New York are like, nah, everything sucks outside of New York. So one of the things that they can stick it up where the sun don't shine is Robert's pizza nationally recognized here in the States in the top 50 for best pizzas in the States. And it's in the top 100 best pizzas in the world. I think it's number 10 here in the States. As far as pizza and it's the new haven style pizza so very much yes i know like new york style where you got the long thing and you know the long pizza and you hold it like a boat and eat it or whatever it's phenomenal and it's in a really cool part of town actually it's up in streeterville depending on where you're at or over there by streeterville but uh you know just north of navy pier downtown by the Ogden Slip, which is like this little hidden oasis of an area of the city. The Ogden Slip is almost like a local version of Navy Pier because, and it doesn't jet on the water per se, but it does have the water jet inland where it feels like you're on a pier. It's a very bizarre thing, but um, you got to check out if you ever are looking for a cool area in the city, got to hit up Robert's Pizza. Uh, Robert and his wife, Dana, are phenomenal hosts and people. They have a beautiful uh, setting inside the restaurant, very cool space. And like this old area, when I was a kid growing up in the city, it was like where you go play like arcade games. That's like this old, it says like River West on the building, you know? So, I mean, I guess you'd call it River West, but it's Streeterville. Um, But it used to have like these video game places. There used to be like a Pizzeria Uno back in the day in there. I think maybe CBS used to be in that McClurg building. I'm not sure. It was somewhere around there either way. They renovated the building and then it became nothing for a long time. And Robert bought out, he said it was like an old storeroom or something like that, that he turned into a restaurant. And it is a long, beautifully designed restaurant. His wife, Dana, did a great job of decorating it. And, uh, you know, like, it's just a, it's a great place to go for the food. It's exceptional. The pizza obviously is great. Other food is great. The Italian food is phenomenal. The arcini balls are amazing. So I would suggest going there to check out the pizza and the views. They have a little dockside, uh, outdoor seating area where you can just hang out and you feel like you're on a vacation. If you live in Chicago, you know, this is like the struggle every Chicagoan has this time of year. Do you leave the city to go on vacation or do you like take a staycation to stay here? Because this is the kind of weather you've waited for all winter long. And it's hard pressed to leave this city in the summertime and places like Robert's Pizza is great. So anyhow, I would suggest going there. It's on the website. Uh, the title of the story, Chicago's own celebrated 
Pizzeria achieves global recognition and prepares for world pizza ceremony in Naples. So that's where they're going to decide where they are in the top 100 in the world. So very cool. Uh, another cool thing that has globally impacted many people is the movie The Exorcist. If you haven't seen it yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Uh, it's probably the best horror movie of all time. I mean, I think people argue between The Shining and The Exorcist, but they're very, and they're both have to do with like you know, things you can't really see, demons, spirits, what have you, hauntings. Um, but The Exorcist was directed by William Friedkin, who is uh, was a director of The French Connection and many other things in Hollywood. Grew up right here in Chicago. His parents were Ukrainian immigrants that came to the States. He was born in the 30s, and uh, he was fascinated with movies. He watched them on WGN, their movies of the week. They would have all these movies on. So much so that when he got old enough, in while in high school, he started working at WGN, which is cool because I worked at WGN for a long time. And when I was there, he came in to visit talking about one of his books that he wrote and he was the nicest man. And like, you think about like the movie, the exorcist and what that did for cinema, for horror, it changed the landscape of everything about that. And he talked about that and he talked about his roots here in Chicago and he went to Sen high school and which is right at Admore, like 50, I'm trying to look at this 5,800 North Admore, uh, there in like the Rogers park area and, uh, our Edgewater. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, he was a cool guy, and Chicago named the street after him, the Honorary William Freakin' Way. So it's right in front of Sen High School because that's where he went to high school. So I thought that was pretty apropos that they did that. So if you're looking for like a cool little nugget when you're out exploring the city, I would suggest doing that because it's right there on Sen. And like that area right there is also like a really kind of a um, kind of like a shortcut to get to the lake from the north side. You kind of cut through that area and you pass by Sen High School. So. Very cool. Sorry, I'm going to just lean here and look up at the other things that we did this week. Oh, right. Uh, I talked to a gentleman who wrote the book. Oh, it's holding up the computer right now. A uh, book about the Blues Brothers and what that was like and what was going on in Belushi and Aykroyd's life at the time. Fascinating look at the Blues Brothers. I didn't know Belushi almost died during the making of the Blues Brothers. I heard he you know, was a hard drinker and all that stuff during Animal House and other movies and actually and you know sadly enough that's what got him in the end but like he almost died during the making of the blues brothers he went on a bender they had to like do all these things to get him ready to go among other things that had nothing to do with like belushi and his health was just the way they filmed the movie in chicago back then like they had car blanche no other big city in the united states would give them this access that chicago did because jane byrne was the mayor and jane byrne was the first female mayor in chicago and when she got to be mayor, basically every dude in Chicago that was in politics didn't want her to be mayor, you know, and they were mad at her. And prior to her, Chicago was kind of closed for movies. They didn't show it off like the old man daily wanted to. He told people if they wanted to see Chicago, they should come to look at it in person, not watch it in a movie. You know, at least that's what I've been told. Well, she was like, screw them. They're all a bunch of jag offs and I'm going to do what I want. And uh, she gave them, like, essentially the keys to the city. I mean, if you see, they, like, destroy a daily plaza. So take that for what it's worth in terms of when you hear about Jane Byrne and how she was perceived back then. She let them do whatever they wanted in the city, and they did. The car chase scene that basically starts up at, like, Lake Geneva and goes all the way down to the city. One of them, um, you know, the, the on, along Lake Street there, the plaza, the troops, the whole thing. It was outstanding. They couldn't make that movie today if they tried. It would be too expensive. But it was a moment in time of movie making and culture that the Blues Brothers, Aykroyd, Belushi, Landis wanted to highlight. And what they wanted to highlight wasn't necessarily of these, you know, guys, whatever. Um, they wanted to highlight the, the the term in the movie, we're on a mission from God. That was a double entendre in the movie. A lot of people don't know that. They were on the, in the movie, they were, you know, trying to save the orphanage that they were in. But in real life, when they wrote this, when they con conceptualized the whole thing, on a mission from God was doing what was right by our peers of the past. And they were talking about the blues musicians, the rhythm and blues people. And on a mission from God was to help them be recognized and save their careers. Because prior to the Blues Brothers, like Ray Charles and James Brown, they were playing like, you know, Jefferson Park Fest, you know, or like random street side casinos in the bottom. They were nobody wanted to hear blues music. Aretha Franklin wasn't doing anything of note. This movie revived all of their careers, you know, 
Donald Duck Dunn, you know, all these blues artists. They even asked B.B. King, which a lot of people didn't know. They asked B.B. King, but he was actually the only like blues artist that was still kind of doing mainstream work because he's B.B. King. But you had all these other guys underneath that were just trying to make a living, you know, playing at Kingston Mines, the Blue Note, all these other places. But they wanted to make a movie to honor these legends. You know, you had Ray Charles in it, James Brown, Aretha Franklin. You had all these legendary blues guitar players that were in the Blues Brothers band. That's why they made the movie. Like, that was their number one reason why, because they love that music so much. And that's why that movie is so special. And so if you haven't seen it, because it's an, it's an older movie. It's over 40 years old, uh, over 45 years old. Uh, it's a good watch if you want to catch up on a movie that you haven't seen in a long time. The music's exceptional. The dancing's great. The scene with Ray Charles dancing in the street on the south side of Chicago. Probably one of the coolest dance scenes. It's like right up there for me, like the thriller scene in Thriller, the uh, music video. So I talked to uh, Daniel, who wrote the book. It's up on the, the site right now. So take a look. It's a deep dive into the book. It's a lot of fun. I also talked about two festivals that happened in Chicago that, that were going on. And I, what I said earlier at the beginning of the podcast about festivals in the city, uh, you know, I mean, you got the Windy City Smoke Out. The ones I talked about this at the end of the week was the Roscoe Village Burger Fest. And also the Taste of River North celebrating 20 years, which is insane that 20 years in River North. So essentially it goes back to like when River North was like the new and up and coming neighborhood in the city, kind of like what the West Loop is now, or even like what Logan or Humboldt Park are kind of like now. I mean, Logan's kind of riding that wave. They're kind of at the end of it. They have peaked, you know, uh, but River North was like the first big investment into the city in a cool neighborhood, you know, like that's when like Rocket opened and all these clubs became restaurants during the day. It wasn't just a club. You know what I mean? It was a really cool time. But, you know, uh, River North, very cool neighborhood. They still have some group, uh, greatest restaurants in the city. So a big festival this weekend. So I, I would encourage you to check that out outside our festival season. And then in Roscoe Village, this, the 17th annual Burger Fest, which I think is insane that they've done that for 17 years. I've lived in the city a long time. Uh, but Burger Fest, you know, they have a, a place. They have different smash burgers, grilled burgers, you know, on the griddle burgers, the whole thing. Uh, very cool experience to check that out they have a they have a marching band that played on a stage and i for, the name escapes me but if you go on the story it's on the story um but it's like a 25 person marching band on stage it's insane but that's like what these neighborhood festivals do they try to be different than the others because there's like on any given weekend in the city there's probably like 10 festivals so these places try to find different entertainment acts to get you to come to their festival you know for you know half of it the other half is just to serve their community because that's what these purpose of these these chamber of commerce put these festivals on that's the donation that you give so they can put on other festivals wine walks and wine tastings and Oktoberfest events and all that that's how all the stuff gets paid for it's all through donations so support a local festival get out of the house try a different uh, neighborhood outside of your own because i think you'd be surprised and my last surprise I'll leave you for the week is a place called the Happy Hour Shop. And it started by this couple named Jess and John. And they have a Instagram handle called Aged and Infused. And it's about like making cocktails. And they kind of started pre-pandemic, but during the pandemic, it like launched them to the stratosphere because they were already making like these little, you know, if you have like a jar like this and it's filled with all these foodie things or, you know, drink things to make drinks. That's what they sold. And she was inspired by her grandparents and her grandparents from the sounds of it were like living the fabulous forties, right? Like they lived the, the, the Mad Men era fifties and they drink cocktails in like the front room of the house that nobody sat in because they had the plastic on it. But it seems like her parent, her grandparents were not those folks. They enjoyed that. They probably were smoking some ciggies or, uh, you know, and had a good time. And that's what inspired her to start the agent infused brand. And now the happy hour shop has that charming vintage uh, wear that you can buy. She finds it. It's not repurposed stuff. This is stuff that she goes and digs around on. I think she, I believe she said Monday and Tuesday, every week they go on a road trip where they look for vintage wear and they bring it, they curate it back at their shop in West town, which is right on Chicago Avenue down from Eckerd park where I used to play softball, which is a fantastic neighborhood. Um, but this place is great because they have all these vintage finds. They have these beer signs that they find that uh, John's parents are finding, and they give it to the kids. They bring it to the shop, and they sell these things. And it's a cool place because it's coming like this little 
uh, area where their friends in the neighborhood also sell stuff like there's candles in there, there's artwork in there, all from locally artists in Chicago. And their story is so Chicago. I love it. And they're the nicest people. Go support people like that. You know, they're not a big box store. They're going to do cocktail making classes a little bit later this year. And uh, it's just a cool spot. You go in there. It's like, go, like, it's like you're in a basement. It's like the basement of Dorothy's, if you've ever been there, but a shop. Uh, but it's got that vibe that, you know, supper club in the winter, you want to cozy up a vibe, but in the summertime, this light, airy, nostalgic place, it's really charming. They are wonderful people. And I couldn't suggest it more to go and check them out. Um, and I would appreciate it if you continue to support the website, go over there, check it out, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you would, that would be great. Uh, just because, you know, that's kind of how this thing works with paying the bills. Um, but um, and then, you know, the podcast. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll see what we get up to next week. I'm going to be driving around the city trying to find neighborhoods I haven't been to before. I think I'm going to go to Inglewood. So we'll talk about that next week. And Inglewood, it, that's a whole podcast in itself. But that's next week. Thanks for watching, everybody. And uh, I'll see you later. Take care.